Knock, knock. Who's there? It's me, Kirby. Duh. Welcome back to my channel. If you're new here and you don't know who I am and you're sitting there thinking to yourself, I'm new here and I don't know who this is and this person looks nothing like their thumbnail. Allow me to explain. Hi, I'm Kirby. I'm a person who likes to do my drag makeup while I talk about a true crime case. So if that interests you, go ahead, stick around, subscribe, because that is precisely what we're gonna do today. I've got my makeup hat on, I've got my sex, drugs, and rock and roll t-shirt, and I, I'm ready to go. So without further ado, let's freaking go. Okay, um, before we get into it and I start covering these brows, I did just want to give a little bit of a content warning. As always, true crime in general is just like, you know, a blanket content warning. Specifically for this case, however, we do have mentions of suicide as well as domestic abuse. So if that is hard for you in any way, go ahead, skip this one, come back for the next video, take care of yourself, please. Other than that, let's, uh, let's start. At 10 a.m. on October 12th, 1978, the phone at the front desk of the Chelsea Hotel in New York began to ring. When the receptionist answered the phone, on the other end was a guest letting them know that room 100 needed help and needed it immediately. So, of course, because, you know, this is what they're trained to do, they made their way to room 100, and when they got there, they were shocked to find a scene they could never have even imagined. I mean, I don't know if that's true when you work in a hotel. I bet you do imagine some pretty horrific stuff. But anyway, before we get into what they found in that room, we gotta, you know, go back and start at the beginning. Nancy Laura Spongen was a horrible child. Literally anyone will tell you that. She was born on February 27th, 1958 in a suburb of Philadelphia to a well-to-do family. People say well-to-do, We'll just say middle class. But get this, when she was born, she was actually born with her umbilical cord wrapped around her neck. And this wasn't just like a little, oh, oopsie, we'll untie that. No, it was so bad, it nearly killed her. She literally almost died of oxygen deprivation at like minutes old. How it's scary. And from all the official reports, there was no brain damage. But take this with a grain of salt because it is the 50s or was the 50s. And um, they were still doing lobotomies in the 50s for Christ's sake. So I take some of these like medical, what do you call it? Medical, um, medical, medical, whatever, you get the picture. Just take it with a grain of salt. But officially on paper, there was no brain damage from the, <gasps> I forgot to put concealer down first. She had to spend the first eight days of her life in a hospital due to this loss of oxygen. So yeah. Anyway, TLDR, Nancy survived this treacherous birth and went home with her family. But according to her mother, Deborah, Nancy was an awful baby, her words, not mine, like truly cried all the time, wouldn't be quiet and wouldn't sleep. I don't know, she was possessed or something. And this behavior started before the Spongins even got Nancy home. Deborah said that she remembers during those first eight days in the hospital, Nancy would just not calm down, kicking and screaming, almost as if she was fighting off some unseen enemy. 
she just couldn't chill. And it just continued to get worse and worse once they got home. Babies cry, sure, but apparently it was so bad and so constant that they decided they had to consult a doctor. That was when at just three months old, Nancy was prescribed a liquid barbiturate. All right, so for those who don't know, barbiturates can be very addictive. So it's like a little wild to me that a doctor would prescribe this to a three month old. It was supposed to work as a sort of depressant and it would relieve anxiety and help her sleep. And can I just cut in to add how awful it must feel to be a new mom, your baby's crying, you don't know what it needs and it can't tell you what it needs. So you just have to guess. Deborah gave her this liquid barbiturate and hoped for the best, but apparently things just got worse from there. Her violent behavior persisted. Her mother described her as difficult, impossible to control, prone to tantrums, hostile, insatiable, demanding, and when they eventually had another daughter, Nancy quickly became a bully. Deborah said, quote, a seven-year-old ran our household, end quote. Whenever Nancy wanted something, she, quote, hollered and screamed and backed us into a corner until we were the ones to back down. And according to Deborah, they would give in almost every time, stating that there was no peace in the household until Nancy got what she wanted. Like she said earlier, insatiable. And this is um, precisely why I don't want kids, because they could turn out absolutely horrendous, and you still have to, you know, love them. So more props to parents with kids like Nancy because whew, I couldn't be me. Deborah, in her book, And I Don't Want to Live This Life, she go on to explain a lot of these stories that happened in Nancy's childhood. And I won't go into detail on all of them, but I will mention, you know, just a few. So first, she attacked her mother with a hammer. She bullied her siblings. She pulled a pair of scissors on a babysitter and threatened to kill her. She threatened her younger siblings right along with the bullying. And she would have these long tantrums where she would go on these suicidal tirades when she was only eight years old. How does an eight-year-old even understand those thoughts yet? At eight, did I even know what any of this shit meant? I feel like no. So yeah, childhood was rough for Nancy and the fam. She was brilliant, but she didn't have a single friend because no one wanted to befriend her. They were scared of her, frankly. It also turns out that unbeknownst to Nancy's parents, during these like countless trips to the hospital and you know, whatever, her doctor had actually diagnosed her with schizophrenia, but uh, failed to tell the parents, which is that even legal? To diagnose a literal child with a mental illness and not disclose it to the parents? I looked it up and um, yeah, it doesn't look like there's any like legal repercussions, but um, pretty unethical nonetheless. Nancy, when reflecting on her childhood, basically said that living with her parents was pretty hellish for her. She said, quote, I hated them so badly. I just couldn't stand them. My parents didn't like me at all, end quote. Uh, so it sounds like a pretty difficult and sad situation all around. Uh, I'm not a psychologist, Avi, but it truly sounds like such a vicious cycle. Like I'm just asking, 
How do you get out of it? Then when she was 11, Nancy walked out of her classroom and was expelled. I personally suspect there had to be like quite a bit more to it. But according to this, she just walked out of class numerous times and it was finally just one too many. And because of this and the situation at home, she was sent to a private boarding school. One for, I don't want to say misfits or outcasts, but... This school was the Devereux Glenholm School in Connecticut, and the kids who attended were kids who didn't adapt well to public school, or they hated authority, they'd been in trouble, they'd been expelled, etc, etc. It was a place for troubled teens. And if you thought this like change of scenery and new school would mean she'd finally find some sort of comfort or peace, or even just people she could relate to. Uh, yeah, you're wrong. This did not happen. She didn't fit in at this school either, and at just 14, she ran away from the campus and attempted to take her own life by slitting her wrist with a pair of scissors. <sighs> After she was found, she was, um, of course, sent to a mental institute where after, you know, pretty extensive testing, she was once again diagnosed as schizophrenic. This time, however, to her parents' knowledge, Nancy was very, very, very smart. When she completed multiple IQ tests, she had a verbal IQ of one 35, which um, placed her as very superior and an overall IQ of 129, which placed her as superior. With that in mind, Nancy actually graduated high school in 1974 when she was just 16 years old. She had already been accepted to the University of Colorado Boulder and began attending when she was still just 16. And honestly, this might contribute to why she didn't like people. Imagine being 16 and you're in a class full of like 18 and 19 year olds and you're kind of smarter than them. That probably sucks, to be honest. But then just five months into her freshman year, she was actually arrested for purchasing marijuana from an undercover police officer. To which I say, look how far <laughs> we have come in just a short amount of time because I literally live in a city now where there are dispensaries on every corner like it's a f***ing Walgreens or something. So shortly after she was arrested for this attempt to buy marijuana from an undercover police officer, she was actually arrested for storing stolen property in her dorm room. And because of this and how, you know, kind of bad this looks, the University of Colorado decided to expel her. And because she was just 17, still a minor, this meant her father had to travel to Boulder, Colorado and accept a plea deal on Nancy's behalf because she wasn't old enough to do it yet. And uh, this plea literally resulted in her being banished from the state of Colorado, literally banished from a whole ass state. Can you banish someone from a state? So after being banished from a whole ass state, she went back to live with her parents, but y'all already knew that wasn't going to work. So shortly after she packed all of her shit, moved out and made her way to New York City. Well, you got to remember, this is not like New York as you might picture today. This was the New York of the 70s, much more gritty 
and scary and less idyllic, which to me personally, New York is never idyllic, but you know, if that's your dream, that's your dream. Anyway, Nancy had to quickly figure out how to survive and she did so by working these odd jobs, stripping, sex work, clothing stores. But the most fateful job she would take during this time was probably that of a music journalist, a freelance music journalist. And that was because by doing so, she was introduced to this new up and coming rock scene called punk and she fell in love with it. So much so that in her free time, she actually became a groupie hanging around and following bands like Aerosmith, Bad Company, The New York Dolls, and The Ramones. And of course, as we know Nancy by now, she's not a quiet, sit back and watch type of girl. Mm -mm -mm. You know, she's an in your face, do what needs to be done and do it her way type of girl. She didn't want to just sit back and experience this scene. She wanted to run this scene. So she did. And of course, this led a lot, and I mean a lot of people to hate her. They called her rude and shrill and annoying and eventually dubbed her Nauseating Nancy. From my understanding, they would say it to her face. They did not care. Fellow groupies explained that Nancy quickly started becoming like a new kind of groupie and she she embodied all of the nastiest parts of the scene. One of the girls said, quote, we were tired of being nice and it was like, fuck you, end quote. And while the other girls hanging around started to outwardly hate her, the members of the bands that she followed loved her and they loved her for one very specific reason her ability to procure heroin for them she wasn't the prettiest she wasn't the nicest and she was absolutely uncontrollable but she could get them heroin so she was able to stick around and i don't know as much as it sounds like Nancy probably wouldn't be someone I'd get along with in real life. I kind of can't help but admire her at this point. Like, her take no prisoners, give no fucks attitude seems kind of cool. You know how sometimes you just see someone, you see some people walking, and they just look cool. And I they might not actually be cool. In this case, Nancy wasn't very cool but when you look at them they radiate cool energy I don't know I think I think you'll know what I mean but if you don't I can't explain it sorry <laughs> and while it may seem like Nancy was this awful unfriendly mean hag from hell a journalist who knew her at the time Lex McNeil, I'm ignoring talking about his name, recalls that Nancy was actually pretty cool and pretty nice. He said a few times he would go to her apartment because it was pretty close to his work. And every time he went, she was friendly, welcoming, and nice enough. He also recalled her love of punk music by saying, quote, Nancy had one of those passions for rock and roll that very few people had. She knew everything about every album, end quote. A photographer who hung around the punk scene quite a bit said that Nancy was pretty unapologetic about who she was, stating that the ideal for groupies was skinny, blonde, and fashionable, but Nancy was... Pretty much the antithesis of this, she came in, shook shit up, and made her own space. If this world isn't making room for you, 
make that room for yourself. You know what I mean? But eventually Nancy did want a bit of change. So she followed a band called the Heartbreakers to London. Some say Nancy wore out her welcome in New York. But honestly, I don't think Nancy would do anything she didn't want to do. If she felt like she was wearing out her welcome, she seems like the type who would double down and stay just to spite everyone else. Do you know what I mean? When Nancy would later talk about why she wanted to move to London, she said, quote, I read the first Sex Pistols review, which was shit. And I said, I got to get over there. And I started saving up for London, end quote. Now, legend has it that Miss Spongin actually set a goal of $5,000 and she raised $5,000 seven different times. But every time she would reach her goal, she would turn around and spend it on heroin because by this point she had become a pretty intense heroin addict and then finally she buckled down saved up five thousand dollars hopped on a plane and made her way across the pond for some tea i'm sorry however and it's a big however when nancy finally made her way to london she began suffering from some pretty serious withdrawals. Heroin was much, much, much easier to get in New York than it was to get in London. So because of these withdrawals, she actually started staying with her friend Linda. However, she was not the only person crashing at Linda's at the time. There was another guy there, a guy named Sid Vicious. John Simon Ritchie was born on May 10th, 1957 in Lewisham, London, England. He was born to a woman named Anne Ritchie and his father's name was John. But I don't think we ever find out his father's last name because um, his father's not really in the picture at all. Anne was a part of the British Army when she met John Sr. working as a guard for Buckingham Palace. He also worked as a semi-professional jazz musician on the side um yeah the two hit it off one thing led to another bada bing bada boom and was pregnant oh but don't worry they hatched a plan and this plan was john's idea naturally and you'll see in a minute why i said that the idea was that once Anne had the baby she would move to ibiza and John would follow shortly after. Um, as you can guess, John never came, never called, never contacted, and never provided a single penny of financial support for baby John. Big shock, right? So in order to make ends meet, Anne began selling marijuana. After a while of this, she decided she was kind of sick of living in Ibiza and um, she sought the help of the British embassy in Spain to help her move back to England. So she returned to England with baby John in tow and settled in Tunbridge Wells, Kent. From now on, when I say John, I'm talking about baby john not big john that guy's gone okay he's never gonna be seen from again and you know i'm doing a little punk look so i'm just gonna kind of be like in 1965 Anne met and married christopher beverly and he was totally down to help raise john unfortunately just six months after marriage he would actually die from kidney failure which is just so sad. So once again, this left Anne and John just kind of in the wind. They were desperate and poor, which is a 
horrible combo. And because of this, Anne had to return to drug dealing, which I'm not here to pass any judgments. What I am about to tell you though, I am passing judgments on because allegedly she would use John to smuggle drugs between Spain and London. I don't know how early this drug smuggling started, but yeah, either way, no one's going to suspect that kid has drugs somewhere on him. By 1971, when John was just 14 and was unfortunately fully consumed by her addiction to heroin and other opiates. It was so bad that John was practically raising himself by this point. He had to take it upon himself to enroll himself in school. Like truly, Anne didn't even know whether or not he was going to school. Um, so John had to do all that himself. So yeah, John enrolled himself at Kingsway College of Further Education, which is once again, very similar to Nancy's story, a school for students with difficulties, which sucks because John was smart and he probably could have handled public school but his home life was so difficult that it made school difficult uh, which is just so heartbreaking. I hate shit like this. It just breaks my heart. It's at this school that he confides in a counselor that he was seriously contemplating suicide and he would also later confess that during these years he would torture and kill cats. Um, Big yikes. That's a very big ick for me. Anyway, at just 16, his mom looked at him and said, quote, it's either you or me and it's not gonna be me, end quote. And she kicked him out of the house. Because get this, she said she had to preserve herself and she couldn't do that while still attempting to take care of John. To which I ask, were you even taking care of John? So the year is 1973 and John meets a fellow Kingsway student also named John. And John Lydon introduces John Ritchie to two more Johns. This is just like the, the city of Johns. These other two Johns were John Gray and John Wardle. Okay, so we've got John Ritchie, John Lydon, John Gray, and John Wardle. The quartet quickly becomes known locally and around campus as, you guessed it, the four Johns. And these Johns quickly realize that the John we're talking about was um, a little bit different, stating, quote, he had a weird brooding quality. He was very bright, but he had another side. Even then, he made me feel cautious. An hour or two of his company was enough. End quote. These three other Johns also explain that John didn't really talk about or discuss his family life. It was like this big black hole of mystery to them. They even recalled a time when they met his mother for the first time and stated that it was like she had no interest in his life whatsoever. Eventually, all four Johns did decide to drop out of Kingsway College. And I can just imagine it'd be like, you go to class and it's like, where did all the Johns go? Did you guys, have you seen the Johns today? So it was shortly after they left Kingsway College that they began to squat in various dismal locations. Uh, because remember, they're all only 16 or 17 around this time. So finding somewhere to live, especially a place for four people, was not so easy. So they began squatting anywhere they could. Hold please. Okay, so it was around this time that they also decided that mm, 
maybe all of them going by John, maybe that wasn't the best bet. Like, sure, yes, legally they could, but you have to remember this was a bunch of punk kids before punk was really even a thing. And they were trying to stick out and separate themselves from one another. So yeah, I imagine all sharing the same name was probably a hindrance to that. John Lydon, the first John R. John met, took on the name Johnny Rotten after someone told him he looked rotten because that's punk, you know? Then John Ritchie, the John we're talking about, gave John Wardle the name Jaw Wobble because it just makes sense, okay? Just, just please go with it. Like, don't question it. And then one day when John Ritchie was bitten by Johnny Rotten's hamster, Sid, Johnny Rotten turned around and said, Sid really is vicious. And thus the clouds opened and a golden light shone down as they deemed John Ritchie Sid vicious. And they all laughed because it was, you know, kind of ironic at the time. Sid wasn't really vicious. He was goofy and funny and stylish, very mainstream, but things started going downhill a little, not all at once, but very gradually. People started to worry about Sid when it became clear he needed a lot of attention. Like when he was in a room and people weren't paying attention to him, he was known to just pull out his knife, cut his own hand, and bleed so people would pay attention to him. That kind of thing. Around this time, Sid and his friends, oh god, oh god, Sid and his friends began hanging around King's Road in Chelsea, London. King's Road at the time, this was kind of like the epicenter of what was known as Swinging London, the place for like all the cool kids where music and fashion were burgeoning. They would actually start to kind of form a band, uh, so to speak, by busking out on the streets. You know what? It is punk to have eyebrows that don't match. If you aren't familiar, busking is the practice of playing music in public in the hopes that people will give you money. Oh, and people um gave them money, all right. They gave them money to stop. That is how not good they were. Now, one of their favorite stores to frequent was a place simply called Sex. This was a store run by a man named Malcolm McLaren, as well as an itsy bitsy little designer named Vivian Westwood. I wonder whatever happened to her. No, I'm kidding. For those of you who don't know, Vivian Westwood would actually go on to pretty much single-handedly define punk style and what it meant to rock punk clothing. But not only that, she would go on to define an entire generation of fashion. And honestly, her vision is so clear that when you see something Vivian Westwood, you just like, no, it's Vivian Westwood. Unfortunately, she did pass away at the end of 2022, which was a huge loss to fashion, but that's not what this video is about, so we'll just move on. The other person in the store, Malcolm McLaren. He's he's important to the story though, because see, Malcolm didn't just run this store. He would also scope out the customers and determine who he thought was cool enough to put in a band. See, he didn't care if they played music or they were even good singers, good musicians, what have you. He knew that at the time, it was all about the look and the vibe and not necessarily talent, so to speak. But before we go further, I am think I'm done with this. So like I was saying, this Malcolm McLaren guy, he didn't really care about talent, 
or ability to play, even play a guitar or sing a note. He was all about branding and he would keep his eye on who he thought was cool and would make a good star. This was when one day he spotted Johnny Rotten shopping at his store and Johnny was wearing a pink Floyd t-shirt. Now at the time, Pink Floyd was huge, okay? But on this t-shirt, Johnny had scrawled, I hate over the decal, you know, kind of as like a, oh, yeah, stick it to the man. But McLaren thought this was extremely cool. And he was no dummy to the punk scene going on around him. And he knew that Johnny Rotten had something, so he approached him and asked him if he wanted to be in a band. And when Johnny Rotten went back to sit in the boys, he was basically like, oh yeah, um, I'm in a band called the Sex Pistols now. At first, Sid was not part of the Sex Pistols, but he wasn't mad about it. He thought it was awesome. Sid actually became like the Sex Pistols' biggest fan. He also began to kind of cultivate what it meant to be a Sex Pistols fan and what that looked like. He was cool, he wore tight jeans and leather and ripped graphic tees, and he made these like pithy and nihilistic statements that began to define this new age of punk rock as we would come to know it. Stuff like, quote, I've only ever been in love with a beer bottle and a mirror, end quote swoon. I'm kidding. He became kind of like um, a socialite among the punk scene. Like I know that juxtaposition doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Picture Paris Hilton opening a club in 2003. That's how Sid was for the Sex Pistols, okay? He wasn't really in any bands, but he was very well known and consistently featured in the punk magazines at the time. McLaren would even ask Johnny Rotten to make sure Sid came to every show and drank and ran wild and just acted like his natural crazy self. Say what you want about Malcolm McLaren, but uh, he really knew a thing or two about branding something. Sid became so popular that he would even create these signature dances that the crowds would actually adapt and repeat for shows to come. Okay, but you know how I mentioned earlier that people were worried about Sid and they knew he was violent, but it was always like self-destructive. He tended to keep these tendencies to himself. Well, it was around this time that he started to become outwardly violent towards others. More specifically, before joining the Sex Pistols, he was set to join another band called The Damned, but at last minute, they chose someone else to be in the band. And when Sid ran into them in public, he grabbed a glass, took aim, aimed at the guy's head, and threw it as hard as he could, but it didn't hit the intended target. It uh, hit a pillar, shattered so violently that a shard of glass actually like flew out and partially blinded some random woman who just happened to be standing there. And even though Sid literally couldn't even play the bass, in February 1977, he replaced the original bass player and officially joined the Sex Pistols. So as legend has it, one night Sid actually played the first Ramones album non-stop and mimicked it and by morning he actually wasn't too bad at playing bass anymore. <laughs> However, he wouldn't play his first show with the band until April of 77 because he was in and out of the hospital with hepatitis because as much as some people like to report it as such, he was deep into heroin before he ever even met Nancy. Johnny Rotten at one point uh, even recalled a time that Sid's mom actually gifted him a baggie of heroin for his 
16th birthday. And Sid was basically like, it's no big deal, man. She means well. It helps me sleep. Uh, that's, um, a very fact, okay? As soon as he joined the Sex Pistols, he went all in 150%. He ramped up his own image and took it to the next level. It's speculated by those who knew him. This was kind of his way to deal with his shyness because remember I said Sid wasn't a boisterous person. He was shy, would sit in a room and be quiet. I'm sorry, I keep getting lipstick on my teeth, but it's punk, okay? This is punk. Yeah. People kind of thought this was a way of him dealing with that shyness, kind of like he might have been scared to be on stage. So every time he was on stage, he just went wild thinking that if he acted wild and crazy people would be too scared or enthralled to judge him honestly he's probably right okay and famously sid would inject anything now buckle in because this next story is um very horrific and if you can't stomach gross things that have to do with injections uh hit the skip button a few times so there was this incident with Dee, Dee ramon from the ramones where the two entered a bathroom went into a stall and this stall was completely covered in vomit. And according to Ramon, Sid nonchalantly stuck the syringe he had been using into the toilet bowl, drew water from said bowl, and then injected the contents like he was injecting a drug. My stomach hurts. Anyway, during this time, his stage persona gets more and more aggressive and violent, but that only made people love him even more. And I don't just mean like aggressive and violent. I mean, it also got worse. Talent wise, there were times when the band wouldn't even plug in his amp because he was truly so messed up, he couldn't play. But that's the weird psychology behind all this because the audience truly didn't care if he was good or not. They were solely there to see the spectacle that was Sid Vicious and watch as he tore the stage to shreds, basically. But Sid wasn't the only violent sex pistol. In fact, all of them quickly garnered a rep for being threatening and violent, especially when they signed with a and Records and then were dropped the very next day for their violent outburst toward a radio DJ, one in which Sid literally threatened someone with the end of a broken bottle held up to his face. Um. Also, another quick little anecdote from this time period, Sid had gotten arrested for taking a bike chain and lashing and NME reporter with it three times. So yes, shit is getting pretty violent. This not only got them dropped from their record label, but also banned from having their music played on the radio, period. Nevertheless, in October of 1977, they would release their first and only record, Never Mind the Bullocks, to huge fanfare. The album debuted at number one despite the fact that it was banned on radio stations countrywide for the song God Save the Queen, wherein they uh, pretty severely dissed the queen and the monarchy as a whole, and this angered a lot of people. People in the UK really go up for the monarchy for whatever reason. And this led to the Sex Pistols being physically attacked on numerous occasions and no venues wanted to book them. But this didn't seem to phase Sid whatsoever. He said, quote, I've got absolutely no interest in pleasing the general public at all. I don't want to because largely I think they're scum and they make me physically sick, end quote. Quote. To this day, Nevermind the Bullocks is frequently listed as one of the most influential punk albums of all time. Duh. Guys wanted to be Sid. 
girls wanted to be with Sid, and I'm sure some guys wanted to be with him too. You know the vibes. Some of Sid's friends even indicate that he was questioning his sexuality, not in the sense that he thought he might be gay, but that he was scared he might end up being gay. Apparently, Johnny Rotten even had to give him several pep talks to give him the confidence that he could talk to women. But that all changed when he was at his friend Linda's house and Nancy Spungen walked through the door. As soon as they saw each other, it was like, until now, I've always got fun. Maybe not. At first, Nancy was interested in Johnny Rotten. She was fresh off of a breakup with the heartbreakers Jerry Nolan after she had got to the UK and she wanted to bag another punk celebrity. How many times can I do that? However, Nancy, while speaking to Record Mirror, said that she slept in the same bed as Johnny for two nights when he looked at her and said, quote, you want it, but you're not going to get it, end quote. So she moved on to Sid Vicious. The other members of the Sex Pistols hated Nancy, but Sid loved her. He thought she was the cat's meow. And it truly was like a match made in heaven, kind of. These two honestly feel like two people that could only love each other. Do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? Is that too harsh? They brought out the best and absolute fucking worst in each other. Very quickly spiraled into this codependence on sex, drugs, violence, and fame. Johnny Rotten said, quote, in a few weeks, Sid went to being the worst kind of rock and roll idiot you could have a nightmare about, end quote. They tried everything they could to get rid of Nancy, even, awfully enough, dangling her over the balcony by her heels to try and scare her away. Not kidding. I wish I was, but it didn't work. Nancy stuck around and we find out that all of these people kind of suck, like pretty bad. They're all kind of bad, you know? They all seem like they're bad for each other. They should all go their separate ways, I think. What followed after Nancy stuck around was a very public 11 month relationship filled with toxic behavior, public fights, verbal abuse, physical abuse, court appearances, and a large mutual dependency on heroin. At one point, McLaren even planned to have Nancy kidnapped, okay, and put on a plane back to America. However, that didn't work simply for the fact that Sid and Nancy were literally inseparable. They were never apart. I can't emphasize enough the codependency they had developed by this point. There's like one story where Nancy had walked away for a hot sec and a girl walked up and was trying to hit on Sid. Nancy saw, walked up to him and told him to push the girl down the stairs and he f***ing did it. No questions asked. He just pushed her. Sid also told Record Mirror that Nancy was kind of becoming like his backup or bodyguard in a sense like they were partners in crime saying that one time quote i got in a fight at the speakeasy but i got my hand in his mouth and ripped it open while nancy kicked him in the balls end quote but the violence didn't um stop at strangers soon sid became very physically abusive towards Nancy. People would argue that, well, Nancy was very verbally abusive. And while, well, yes, neither form of abuse is okay, we don't need to escalate it to physical abuse. In one report from NME Magazine in December 1977, it claimed, based on a statement 
from Nancy that Sid had attempted to throw himself from a third story window in hopes of taking his own life but Nancy grabbed him by the belt just in time and pulled him back in. Apparently this thwarted attempt sent him into a whole new spiral of rage and he grabbed Nancy by her hair and quote drove her head against the wall relentlessly again and again until he finally stopped just as she was about to lose consciousness end quote the relationship had become so toxic and disruptive that when the sex pistols embarked on their first and only north american tour since they weren't really allowed or couldn't really find anywhere to play in the uk malcolm mclaren and the other band members banned nancy from joining them they were like absolutely and that, okay? However, Sid was real messed up without Nancy. Halfway through the tour, McLaren said that Sid began to dislike everything except Nancy and heroin. But he wasn't getting the heroin he wanted in the States and he was going through withdrawals and it made his mood swings even more violent. At one point, he would even hit an audience member in the head with his guitar, okay? He was spiraling. He would also begin to self-mutilate, carving sayings into his chest like, give me a fix, before each show, and just going out on stage, blood everywhere, willy-nilly. And as concerned as Malcolm McLaren might want to act after the fact, during it, he was doing absolutely nothing to help. He purposefully booked a lot of their tour dates in the south sending him to these little like places he knew they'd have altercations to drum up publicity. Sid was becoming openly combative with audience members even greeting the Dallas audience by calling them um, cowboy f-words and causing a huge scene. This caused Sid to fully check out by this point. He wasn't even pretending to play at these shows anymore. And the Sex Pistols, specifically Johnny Rotten, were getting over it really, really fast. By the time they reached their eighth American show in San Francisco, Johnny Rotten told the crowd that they had been cheated out of a show and walked off stage, effectively causing the breakup of the Sex Pistols on January 14th, 1978. So this left Sid alone, lonely, and fearful of what was to come. He was internationally notorious. This is where I need to jump in and remind everyone that these people are 21 years old. Nancy was only 19 at this time. I keep forgetting because this world that they're living in feels so adult. But like I said, Sid was feeling lost and alone. So on January 19th, he hopped on a plane and flew from San Francisco to New York. It was during this flight, okay, midair, that he actually slipped into a Valium, methadone, and alcohol-induced Coma. And because of this, as soon as the plane landed, he was rushed to a hospital and as soon as he woke up, the doctor informed him that if he continued to drink like that, he would be dead within six months. This was when Nancy flew back to the United States and the two were finally reunited. However, a few months later, the lovebirds journeyed to Paris to film the Sex Pistols mockumentary, The Great Rock and Roll Swindle. Needless to say, filming was rough, especially for Sid as he and Nancy preferred to just hunker down in their hotel room and shoot heroin all day. When Sid did manage to get himself together enough to leave for a day and record a few songs and work on the movie, director Julian Temple recalls that Nancy made sure he knew that was a bad idea and um, she did this by superficially cutting her own wrists, letting it bleed 
all over the bed and telling Sid that if he left her alone again, she'd kill herself for real next time. That's emotional abuse. It's manipulative and horrific and just so chaotic. I don't know. I can't even pretend to understand where people come from sometimes. After filming wrapped and the couple returned back to New York, Nancy had set herself up as Sid's manager and Sid embarked on somewhat of a solo career. And this career was successful enough that in August of 1978, they were able to move into the Chelsea Hotel, settling into room one. If you thought this meant they were starting to settle down and get their life together, you'd be wrong. These shows that Sid would perform often led to chaos with the audiences booing him off stage and Sid yelling these vicious insults at them instead of actually performing. But I do question what they expected when you expect someone to act like that and then they act like that and get praised. Of course, they're going to keep acting like that. He's doing what he thinks people want. I don't know. The drug abuse became worse. And with that, so did the physical abuse. Sid, quote, used Spongin as a punching bag when struggling with his own issues, and it only worsened when the Sex Pistols broke up for good, end quote. But in public, they remained this couple. I was going to say happy couple, but that was never really their brand. Their brand was always kind of like chaos and rock and roll. They wanted to maintain that everything was hunky-dory and to maintain this image they had built, Sid and Nancy had become as much of a brand as Sid Vicious by this point. In early October, they actually participated in this live interview setup where people could call in and ask questions. And the interviewer said it was like Sid had forgotten Nancy was even there. And in these interviews, it is very easy to remember just how young Nancy was. She was chewing her gum, nervously flipping her hair, and kind of looked like she was just hoping to fit in. I wish these two would just break up. Then around October 1978, Nancy did call her mom to ask for some money. And it was on this phone call that she complained about kidney pain she had been dealing with. And she also confessed that the bruises her mom had seen were not from just some randos, but from Sid. And while doing so, she asked her mom if her mom could help them get into a detox program. Around the same time, Sid wrote Nancy a love note called What Makes Nancy So Great? In it, he listed things such as beautiful, great sense of humor, makes extremely interesting conversation, has fab taste in clothes, and has beautiful eyes. And I can't tell you the whiplash I was getting from writing this case. On October 11th, Sid and Nancy decided to have some people over for a party, but Sid was pretty much catatonic the whole time. At the beginning of the night, he took 30, that is 30, two-in-all pills. I'm not sure how to say it, but two-in-all is a powerful combo of two barbiturates and would effectively act as a tranquilizer. So yeah, he took 30 of those and laid there basically comatose as others partied around him. Throughout the night, it was kind of like this revolving door of people coming and going, stopping by to party for a little and then leave. And you know, hotels and apartments, anything with shared walls, you can hear what's going on around you. Around 7.30 in the morning of the 12th, people heard female moans coming from room 100, as well as a little bit of a commotion. But if you heard your neighbor partying all night, you'd probably just think they were stumbling around, hungover, sick, or still drunk. So they kind of like moved on. But then, like I mentioned at the very beginning, at 10 a.m., the front desk 
began receiving phone calls of distress about something that was going on in room 100. A bellman went to check it out and when he got there, he walked in and discovered Nancy only in a bra and underwear slumped under the bathroom sink and bleeding profusely from a stab wound in her abdomen. And it did not take them long to find Sid Vicious um, dazed and wandering around the hallway, allegedly wailing, I killed her. According to Sid, he came out of his tuinal induced stupor and saw a trail of blood leading into the bathroom. He decided, of course, to follow it. And this is where he found Nancy, and it was very clear she was dead. Also, there is a photo of Nancy from the scene, so I wouldn't recommend looking it up. I will say, however, if you do research into this case, be wary because chances are you're going to see it. I saw it on, I think, two or three different websites without me even trying to see it. And I just think it's kind of like disgusting that even in the very end, her dignity was pretty much stripped from her. She was 20 years old and she had bled to death. And what truly sucks about this situation is that if Nancy had been with anyone coherent or there had been anyone around that was there and cared about her, she would have survived, no question about it. This wound would not have been deadly had she gotten medical attention right away. So of course, police show up and arrest Sid Vicious and they charged him with second degree murder. To them, it's a no brainer. He was the only other person known to be in the room with her and he was quite literally shouting that he did it. At first, when he was asked what happened, he said that they had gotten into an argument and then he stabbed her. And then he said, actually, he didn't know what happened because he couldn't remember. But then he said she had accidentally fallen on to the knife. But he was literally knocked out because of the drugs. Like, what did they expect? Of course, his story is going to change, but many people did not and do not believe that Sid killed Nancy. And to be honest, I'm kind of not sure what I believe either. There are a few theories floating around out there. This is the one I think I tend to believe the most. This one involves a guy named Rockets. Red glare, red glare, all one word. Apparently in January of 1989, he was hanging out at some bar and he began to brag about the fact that he was the one who killed Nancy Spungen. He knew Sid was in jail for it, so he effectively got away with it, but decided to brag about it. Why do so many cases involve... Jump scare. Hi. Yeah. So don't you love when your microphone stops working? Okay. Um, that is my fault for not paying attention. So yes, past me would have cut the whole video and never post it, but I'm here to tell you I'm a new person. Okay. Anyway. Yeah. So as I was saying, I don't understand why so many cases include people who more than likely get away with a crime and then they just turn around and brag about it. That's what Rocket's red glare was doing. According to him, he was there for the party that night. But at one point, it was just him, Sid, and Nancy. Sid was passed out, apparently like gray and lifeless. He looked like a corpse. And when Nancy left the room, he actually decided to snoop around the room. This is when he found a stash of cash in a drawer and decided to take it. Nancy then caught him. And of course, we all know Nancy by now. And she was not just going to let this fly. So she tried to stop him. He claims that when she began to come after him, he grabbed a knife that Sid had hanging up on the wall and he just took it 
and stabbed her. He watched her make her way into the bathroom. And then as she lost consciousness, he decided to grab the rest of the cash because apparently at that point, what was he going to lose, you know? And he left. He said that he thought he was just leaving two corpses behind. He had no idea Sid was still alive. He truly thought he had overdosed. And to prove this whole story, he pulled out a handful of bills that were allegedly covered in Nancy's blood. Now, the reason I tend to sway towards believing this theory is because Sid and Nancy were known to keep large stashes of cash. Just shortly before this, they had actually had, I think, $1,000 stolen from them. And not only was it known that they had had cash stolen from them before, when investigators looked around the room, they couldn't find any cash anywhere. So yeah, like to me, the pieces kind of add up. Meanwhile, Sid was in jail awaiting trial, but he was attempting suicide every single chance he got. So since officers just didn't want to deal with him, they set his bail incredibly low. By the time Sid was out on bail, his mom, Anne, had come to the United States and he returned to the Chelsea with her and Malcolm McLaren. The first chance he got, of course, he attempted again to take his own life by cutting his wrist with a broken light bulb. He basically said he just couldn't do life without Nancy. It was too hard. He loved her and missed her way too much. However, some people do question how much he actually loved Nancy since shortly after he did get a new girlfriend and move in with her very quickly. To which I say, like, yeah, that's weird, but also Sid is... A, a drug addict, B, grieving, and C, he needed a place to live and Michelle had a place for him to stay. Now, while out on bail, Sid's behavior didn't really get better and at some point, he somehow ended up fighting with Patty Smith's brother and the fight ended with him bashing a bottle against his head and therefore getting himself sent back to jail. While in jail this time though, he was expected to complete a 52 day detox, but his mom visited him very often. And McLaren would later confirm that these visits were not just casual fun visits. She was smuggling heroin in for him, which is just so wild to me. Then on February 1st, 1979, Sid was once again released on bail to await trial. And because of this, Anne and Michelle decided to throw a party at Michelle's house. When Sid arrived, he right away called a friend and asked him to bring him heroin. The really strong stuff. In the early morning hours of February 2nd, 1979, Sid Vicious took a lethal dose of heroin and was dead at just 21 years old. I'll talk about things I didn't know about this case a little later on, but like I truly had no idea these two were so young. I don't even feel old enough for the shit they've gone through. And yeah, that's... Anyway, a later toxicology report would say that the heroin Sid had injected was 80% pure heroin. That's a lot of percent. As the news broke, of course, press, TV crews, and journalists swarmed Michelle's place, but for her part, she never talked to them, never sold her story, changed her name, and moved on. It truly seems like Michelle loved Sid, or if not loved, at least cared about him enough to have some compassion in the aftermath. However, the same cannot be said for Sid's own mom, Anne. Sid's dying wish was to be buried with 
Nancy. In a note he left, he said, we had a death pact. And then he said, I have to keep my half of the bargain. In this note, he wished to be buried with Nancy. And he said, bury me in my leather jacket, jeans, and motorcycle boots. Goodbye. But he was cremated. When Anne reached out to Deborah asking to spread Sid's ashes on Nancy's grave, Deborah said no. And it could have been for a couple of reasons. One, Nancy was buried in a Jewish cemetery and Sid was not Jewish. Two, she just didn't want that to happen. Or three, both. Both options are valid. Now, some people and stories will say that Anne snuck into the cemetery and dumped his ashes without getting permission, but um, Johnny Rotten would later confirm that Anne, seeing the opportunity to exploit her son one last time, used his ashes to smuggle heroin from New York to London. As she approached security, she became antsy and anxious and nervous, so she decided to ditch the heroin, in turn ditching the entire urn that contained Sid's ashes. So for all we know, Sid's ashes are still just floating around Heathrow Airport. Always classy, Anne. Anne also later claimed or admitted that she was the one who gave Sid that final fatal shot of heroin, uh, but she said it was at his own request. Do with that info what you will. Before he died, Sid actually wrote letters to Nancy's mom. I'm bringing them up because he included a poem he had written about Nancy. Quote, you were my little baby girl and I shared all your fears. Such joy to hold you in my arms and kiss away your tears. But now you're gone, there's only pain and nothing I can do. And I don't want to live this life if I can't live for you. To my beautiful baby girl, our love will never die. End Quote. And he was right. Their love did live on, mostly in infamy and kind of as like this term that people used about being in toxic relationships. It still lives on in the popular zeitgeist today. But more notably, this love inspired Kurt Cobain and Courtney Love, but that's a whole other can of worms and I'm not touching it. Eerily enough, just a couple months before Nancy's death, she actually kind of predicted it in a sense. She is famously quoted as saying that she was going to die before 21, saying, quote, I won't live to be 21. I'm never going to be old. I've already lived a whole lifetime. I'm going out in a blaze of glory, end quote, which just, when I read that, oof, I learned so much from researching this case. Like, this has been a case that's always just kind of been on my radar in the sense of, like, it's in the popular zeitgeist. I watched the movie growing up. I know who the Sex Pistols are. I've heard people compare relationships to that of Sid and Nancy, but I always thought it was so much more cut and dry than it is, so much more black and white. Like, I just thought they were a couple that argued a lot and he killed her, point blank, period. I never understood why people glamorized their love, uh, but now I kind of do. Like, it does seem like they really loved each other even though that love was bad love, like it's not good or healthy, but that doesn't change the fact. I don't know. I wish Sid and Nancy had just broken up. I wish Sid had listened to the Sex Pistols when they expressed their concerns. I wish Nancy could have had a childhood in a time when people understood her and could have helped her. I wish Sid had a more supportive family. There's so much I wish, but there's like no point in wishing it. That's what sucks about covering these cases is as I cover them, there's things I'm like, oh, if only that was different. Oh, if that didn't happen. Oh, well, shoot, I wish that didn't happen. And there's no point in doing that because like, it's real. It's history. It happened, but I do it anyway. That is all I have for the star-crossed love of Sid 
and Nancy. Go ahead and comment down below what you think happened. Do you think it was Sid? Do you think it was a drug dealer? Do you think it was some random person? Do you think it was something else entirely? Also, go ahead and comment any case suggestions you might have. I have gotten a few comments and I do make note of them because I'm always looking to cover cases you guys want to see or just simply comment hi hey Kirby what's up another thing I want to add is that I'm trying to come up with the best like filming editing and releasing schedule for me and it looks like Fridays or Sundays are going to be best for posting. I'm thinking Fridays, uh, to be honest, this video is probably going to go up on a Saturday, but a Friday was the intention. Okay. Anyway, if you like this video, go ahead and hit that thumbs up. Let people know you liked it. While you're at it, if you aren't already and you're feeling so inclined, go ahead and subscribe. Stick around and hang out with me whenever I post a new video. As always, thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time. Bye. Oh, I got a hat on this time. Bye.